Hey devs, April here. Welcome back to the Appian Community YouTube channel. Today we have something new and exciting for you. Introducing a new format, Dev Talk, where experienced developers from our community will get into the nitty gritty of delivering great Appian apps out there in the real world. Today I'm joined by five experts to have a conversation all around Appian records and staying up to date with the latest releases. Our incredible guest, with a combined over 50 years of Appian experience. So please ask them all of your burning questions. I'll be monitoring the chat throughout the stream so that I can get your questions to them. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to bring out Dan, Stefan, Matt, Mike, and Josh. All right, full house today. So let's get right into the intros. We'll go uh, clockwise around from the top. So Dan, why don't you start? Thank you, April. Yeah, my name is Dan Yui. I have almost 10 years of Appian experience working at Mastodon Technologies. I've been fortunate enough to work with all sorts of different clients across all different industries uh, as a consultant for the majority of my career. And recently, I've ac actually transitioned to leading our internal training program for all of our new hires and for our ongoing training. So uh, happy to be here and uh, excited to talk about some records. Awesome. All right, Stefan. Hey, yeah, I'm Stefan. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm doing Appian projects since more than 14 years. Wrote the first book about Appian and try to try my best to share my experience with the Appian community. And you can, uh, I run my own blog and podcast at appian.rocks. Awesome. Matt? Hello, my name is uh, Matt Drone. I'm from Montreal, Canada. Uh, I've been working with Appian since uh, 2014, uh, six years now as an independent Appian developer. I uh, work mostly in public sector and financial services. Cool. I, I know I said clockwise, but Josh, I'm going to save you for last and let Mike go next. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Mike Schmidt, and um, I've been in Appian just uh, approaching 12 years now. Um, I started off with a, a company that had me on a variety of federal projects. And these days I'm um, uh, managing a uh, small system for a uh, individual customer, basically. Cool. Uh, all right, Josh, you're a little familiar to the stream audience because you were on our record events live stream a few months back, but welcome back, introduce yourself. Thanks, hey everyone. I'm Josh Linder, <laughs> I'm a product manager at Appian. Been at Appian for about two and a half years now. Worked a lot in the data fabric um, and like sync records features. And yeah, excited to be here and hear from these experts. So Josh is ready to hear how his features are actually getting used and, and what, what people really think about them. So um, this is really meant to be a conversation. Really encourage you all to uh, get involved in the chat, how it's kind of going to work. Uh, so each of our guests have kind of come up with a bit of a topic that they kind of want to bring to the table and then we'll let the discussion flow from there. So we're going to start with Stefan. Uh, where do you start with anything? You got to give it a name. So let's get right into talking about object naming and naming records. Mm -hmm. Yeah, object naming. So um, I in, in the past in my career, I did a lot of trainings, uh, a lot of uh, uh, educating juniors, uh, my own colleagues uh in in various companies but also clients did a lot of uh, on-site trainings uh setting up uh you know center of excellences um and uh one of the kind of important topics uh when building a data model is of course how do you name your uh your entities your fields your relationships um and why there is a <laughs> There are different opinions on certain uh, on certain things that you can do on on or not do. Um, I think it's still a, a extremely important topic, specifically um, when talking about long term maintenance, uh, when you need to swap out people in your team, um, or you need to hand over the whole application uh, to a I don't know to a, to a different vendor or uh, or or, um, or consulting company, um, and. Um, yeah, so um, I came up with a few uh, guiding principles um, just to kind of get started uh, keeping that in mind. Um, and uh, so I think the, the first most important thing is that uh, that uh, bad names are mis misleading. 
and uh, and good names should really tell a story. So um, when you have, I don't know, an entity and, and, and that has a field and it has a relationship and then it relates to in data fabric to, I don't know, uh, various other entities, then in the best case, kind of navigating through that data model should kind of like sound like like a story that you tell or speak out, right? Um, and uh, yeah, then the, the next uh, principle would be uh, to focus on the purpose of a variable or of a field or entity, meaning um, the, the name should kind of describe more what you're doing with it and not that much what it's actually holding, right? So uh, basically nobody cares whether your field is a Boolean or an integer or something, um, but it's more important what are you doing with it, right? Uh, we are coming to a few examples later. All right. so um, should... Yeah, and then don't make people guess. So uh, do not use abbreviations because, you know, an abbreviation means something different to everybody. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, guys, what are your uh, uh, opinions, your, your ex experience uh, with uh, good and bad naming? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think you make a, a lot of good points. Um, from my perspective, uh, you know, obviously abbreviations sometimes are hard because, um, you know, sometimes there's there's a lot of you need to fit in. Your, your field name might be a little long, so I'm interested to know uh, as to find how you tackle those uh, those situations. Yeah, how long mm. is too long for it to not be abbreviated? I don't understand what you mean with too long. <laughs> <laughs> so no, really, I have. Uh, of course, that doesn't happen too often. But uh, but I have I have variables with I don't know twenty five characters, um, and and that's perfectly fine because it tells the story, right? And if it's uh, if it's uh, Im important to have a long name to make something clear, um, then then use that long name, right? It's kind of similar to um, when you discuss about uh, adding comments to your code. So my guideline here would be uh, uh, um, try not, don't use comments, um, but do if you have to, right? <laughs> so if you cannot make uh, express uh, expressive code, so meaning that the code does not tell the whole story, um, then you then please add a, add uh, add comments, but try to be good in writing code, right? And and uh, an, an important part of the code we write um, is um, coming up with good names for variables, role inputs, expressions, um, interfaces, records, related actions, process models, basically everything. Um, and when you put things together together in a in a good way, then <laughs> the chance is high that you don't have to use you know comments, long names, and things. I I like what you said about like making your code good enough that you don't need the comments. I've never really thought about it that way, but I guess that is kind of true. Like if you're lazy about writing uh, comments in your code, then just make your code better so you don't have to write the comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Cool. So I, I know you also had like some tips and tricks that you want to get yeah. into. So maybe these will be some good uh, discussion points to let's pull up some of these tips and tricks you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So uh, again, make names expressive. Uh, a good examples would be user age or total sales amount, right? Uh, uh, when talking about total sales, sales amount, I do not even have to guess the data type because that's pretty obvious. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. um, then um, is user locked in? I think that's a great name. Uh, it indicates that the data type is a Boolean. Um, and um, yeah, of course, bad names would be X or var one or ASDF or something which does not have a a proper meaning uh, and and does not yeah does not mean anything, right? Uh, of course, when I when I'm doing a you know develop a bit of code try to kind of find my way through solving the problem that I have, um, then I also use kind of shorter variable names, right? Um, that's perfectly fine. But once I, I got my my code together and it works and it's tested and, and so on, um, then I revisit the code and, and really try to make it more um, readable and maintainable. 
So uh, then next, no type naming, um, I think, uh, but Matt, you have a, you mentioned that you have a different opinion on that, um, that uh, including the data type, meaning it's an integer or decimal or Boolean into the name of a variable or field. Um, I, I don't like to do that because, you know, in Appian, you always uh, see the data, the, the type of the field. Um, but yeah, seems like to be a yeah uh, something we can discuss on, right? Yeah, on my end, I, I like to put uh, I would like put boolean in the in the field. Obviously, I, you know, I use like uh, you do like is a user logged in is something that uh, I like. I do like the is convention, but you, you know, like you you did for the is uh, is user logged in. I feel like when you're just navigating in code, you don't you're not necessarily looking at the data model, or you don't have the record type in front of you. Uh, if you're just doing like a lookup on the field, it can be pretty handy to to know if it's a date, date time. Um, especially when you're doing manipulations, there could be some like a difference between those those two types of fields. Uh, booleans, obviously, um, integers, decimals. Um, usually for decimals, you know, if it's a percentage or an amount, uh, I know it's going to be a decimal. Um, for an integer, usually, uh, I guess it could be some certain fields, but like I like to put ID, for example, if it's going to be an ID of like a foreign key, a code, if it's going to be like a, a, a code from a reference uh, data table. Um, the only one where I, I won't put anything is a text field. So, <laughs> so yeah. yeah. So yeah, but I find so it handy when I'm, I'm in the code. Yeah, basically the reason for why I, I try to keep that as simple as possible is that um, in, in my time with Appian, I basically learned that Appian is pretty good in duct typing. So meaning um, in, in guessing the data type and, and casting, casting a, a value into basically the value that's appropriate, right? Um, and I know that uh, at the, the comparison operator is not really happy about trying when you try to compare different types but mostly all other places where you where of course you have a data type you can almost put anything in there um, and it still uh, does the right thing whatever that actually means right so you could for example a boolean you could uh, use the string yes or no or a y or an n where a boolean value is actually needed right so appian is pretty clever in doing this and at a certain point in time i decided to trust <laughs> appian okay. in kind of doing the right thing <laughs> and and try to kind of um not dump down but m make make coding on my side a bit simpler right so that's kind of the the my my motivation for uh, for doing that. Yeah, I'll say trust, trust your art typecasting. That's pretty high praise to fun, so I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that makes, that's kind of how I've approached Appian development for the internal, you know, development I've, I've done. We do our mm. dog booting and build, build our own Appian applications internally on Appian. And that's, we generally take the same approach that you do, Stefan. Um, I'll say as far as naming goes, one of the earliest features I worked on at Appian was generating, like generating record views. So some of the object generation features were generating actions and views. And like naming was a big part of what we needed to think about when you have people generating objects where they're dynamic, we have to dynamically generate the names based on the record type name and what kinds of configurations you set up for like the view or the actions that you're creating. And we spent a significant amount of time thinking about that and trying to figure out the right way to name it. Actually, just the other day, I got some feedback from a user who said, oh, I actually want you to change your naming conventions. And we actually are making some improvements or plan to make some improvements to, naming to the naming mm -hmm. name to generate. So that's, that's how important it is. We spent a lot of time on it. We continue to get feedback about it. Um, so yeah, totally agree, this is fun. April, yeah. I was wondering if we want to move on to another topic because I want to make sure to, to, to hear what other people are thinking yeah. about things. Yeah. Well. yeah, let's make that a bit uh, uh, quicker. Um, so a Boolean should, uh, should be the answer to a simple yes, no question. So like is completed or is user logged in, right? So is user logged in is the question and the, the field contains the answer. I think that's pretty simple. Um, then field names always work in a context or not always, but typical, specifically when talking about records, field na names, right? Like if you have a record that is called address, uh, and then of course, uh, the street is the street name, right? 
uh, there is no point in kind of repeating the word address here, right? Yeah, I think especially um, since record relationships have come out, that's like especially true because it's just so so much easier to read. Um, I think yeah. we have, let's see, one more page of tips and tricks. So Yeah, yeah three more and then. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, then uh, our, our language, being it uh, German or English, uh, has a great uh, feature. It's called plural and singular. So please use that when 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 uh, building I don't know a data model or variables or something right. So uh, the record is always in singular because it kind of defines the the the, the structure of that object. Uh, and if you have a variable that takes a list of these records, then make that a plural. Uh, that makes makes it really easy, specifically when when you define uh, a rule input for an expression or something and make that a multiple aka a list of, uh, then please use the plural name so everybody immediately knows that, ah, it's a plural, so I better put a list in there, right? Yeah. Um, then we already have been talking about long names. So, of course, uh, you probably want to avoid 200 characters, but um, but long is good. By the way, you could also theoretically use emojis and just use a single character. Not sure whether that really uh, makes your code more readable. I don't know uh, if that works. Does that work? Yeah, it, it works. I tried it out. You could put hearts and, and smiley faces in your code. All right. Um, I'll QA people. I'm but that's good. maybe not <laughs> another recommendation here. <laughs> Josh is dying now. Um, yeah, I feel like I remember actually testing that at some point. Uh, but yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, uh, the important thing I'm, I I think is um, make make naming a, a part of your team culture, corporate culture. Discuss that. Um, I remember that um, at a point in time, I had with six people a conversation for a full hour about uh, the name of one variable, right? And uh, of course, we didn't have to repeat that uh, multiple times because after doing this, kind of spending six hours on uh, on, var on the name of one variable, we I kind of had uh, a culture set in, in the team um, and that made it way more easier to have a common understanding of how to name things. Yeah. Well, all really helpful. And uh, I know I'm, I'm definitely a culprit when being too fast of, you know, making things quick abbreviations, but it really is worth it in the long run to sit down and do this. Uh, one more thing on the names, Josh, since you mentioned it, is with records chat now, like uh, being able to type, hey, like, what's the deal about this, this, and this, like having better record field names, I'm sure is more helpful for the records chat, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, um, all right, Matt, we'll throw it over to you. Thank you, Stefan. And uh, I'm sure names might come up in the rest of the discussions and you'll be able to hammer <laughs> in some of your points even more. But let's jump to Matt and talk about record events a little bit, something near and dear to Josh. Yeah, so record events uh, got introduced. Josh, I don't even remember the version it got introduced in, but <laughs> hopefully you can help me there. Um, but essentially was to basically is a solution from Appium to, uh, I guess, replace uh, what was known as auditing uh, in the past. Um, so um, in the past, we used to have auditing where we would, uh, you know, the simple basic auditing, we would have like a create, Create it uh, by, graded at, updated by, updated at those fields that you know get uh, put up by default on on records. Um, so it was a very basic form of auditing. Then came uh, audit history. There was an uh, uh, an application or an example in the app uh, market that was uh, basically just it's a, basically one table, and then you put the you know let's say your object type, so your record type, let's say case contact, and then the record ID, and then the action action user action date time. Um, and then you could also optionally put some differences. So let's say uh, you want to put the, you know, the a snapshot of the object there. You want to also put maybe uh, the differences between the old value and the new value. So a bunch of different things that were done there. So that was uh, two the two solutions before record events. Then then came uh, record events um, lately. So and now um, makes it a little more uh, structured. Um, the big difference between the old approach and the new approach is that now your record events are going to be tied to one particular record versus before it was sort of like a composite key between like your um, uh, record type and a record ID. Uh, now you basically have a record ID and then you have a direct relationship to your record. Um, so the, the one thing you need to keep in mind is that you need to you know choose your the record type on which you're going to be doing the auditing 
Um, it's a choice to be made. You know, it's usually going to be your top level entity. Let's say uh, in, in the case that we have a case and then a bunch of different uh, child entities, you might want to choose uh, the top level entity to do your auditing. And then uh, there's a bunch of different things you can do to uh, generate, um, you know, different events. Um, you know, you can use the default uh, record event feature uh, where you have the, uh, it's in the tab, the actual right uh, smart service where you can just uh, specify your different fields. But you can also generate some with the, now with the right related records, you can generate a bunch of events uh, as well uh, if you want to be a little more creative and a little more detailed. Um, so that gives you a bit of an overview of, of you know, what record events could do. Um, but ultimately what I want to talk about is uh, why uh, we do record events. Uh, there's two main purposes. Uh, one is observability. And then the other purpose is traceability. So what we've done in the past mostly is, you know, do we're focused a lot on traceability. Um, you know, who did what, when, uh, basically, so you, we can blame somebody <laughs> who did a mistake somewhere. Um, but uh, that, you know, in, uh, you know, in our previous model where we'd have records, let's say case, uh, update, uh, create, delete, uh, you want to know what happened on the record and who changed what. Uh, but record events, I think, and, and Josh, you can maybe chime in here, but uh, are ba you know, they're meant to record events in your process and to enable uh, or help with uh, process mining uh, later down the line, right? So you want to set yourself up for success um, by inserting the you know, events that will eventually uh, help you uh, optimize your process later on, right? Um, yeah, so I, you, you nailed it. I think um, to build that a little bit, like so process mining, really excited about process mining and what record events is going to enable there. I think I really like the way you jokingly framed like auditing, though, is like figuring out who to blame, because I feel like what we're trying to do with record events is move like move the history of what happened on your record from who do I blame for this problem to let's help people collaborate on getting a business process done, right? <laughs> in some weird way, I feel like the traditional like grid of like auditability steps kind of makes it feel more like get blame, you know, instead and less like kind of like social, like, oh, like April like did this and left a comment on it. And like, I'm kind of curious to see what she did. And like, now I know, now I'm better informed when I call the customer, right? That's what the we want the experience to be is something really more collaborative that feels like empowering and exciting to use. So yeah, that's that's a key a key that dynamic is a key change we're trying to like help create in addition to setting people up for success in their business process. One, one yeah. question I have for you guys is as someone who's built it, one of the things we thought about was the different types, the different event types. You mentioned Matt, like the different event types you have to create. Do you guys typically get a list of a, build a list of all the types of events that happen at once at the beginning of working with a client? Or do you get an initial set of events where you kind of outline the general business process, but then go back and like iterate on that list later as you get more requirements to the customer, like through the engagement? So I I, I typically iterate. I, I I almost never know the the full list of of mm. events that I I would would need to record uh, in the beginning. And uh, and you know when when I talk to my clients, they also don't. So. Um, I, I think that's really uh, something more dynamic, and and that's kind of one of the, the cool features that we have uh, with that platform that we we can change things on 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 the go without without breaking every uh, everything. Right. Um, one question, Josh. Um, the when when talking about record events, do you think this is more a feature of recording technical events, or is this is this more about recording business events, right? So because that's that's the difference, right? So a technical mm -hmm. event could be, yeah, someone uploaded a file. Of course, that could also be a, a, a business event, but you know, um, and and or is it kind of kind of trying to to, to make a, a a a step through the the the, the business process itself, right? Yeah. So it's absolutely about the business process. And I think your example of file upload is really good because one of the challenges that we ran into designing this feature is we knew that we knew we wanted to deliver value around list of business events and give people insight to the business process. 
But what's what is a business event? It's really ambiguous, and ultimately, it's up to you guys, the developers, mm -hmm. because we would have loved to like automatically generate a list of event types or analyze the process processes that run and be like, Zoop, just spit out here's the relevant events. But it's too hard to know how to kind of consolidate and summarize effectively. An example is like if you have um, a document document processing, like an like a AI smart service you're using to like classify documents, is that a part of the business process or not? I mean, in my view, it is. The, the Appian vision of like mixed autonomy is like, I want to know how AI is collaborating with humans to move this business process forward. But ultimately it's, it's a bit of a developer call, but that's an example of the kinds of nuances that, that mean that you guys have to be the ones to define kind of what counts as a business event. Yeah. And I think to that point yeah, too, that's, like that, that's really appreciated. Yeah. To, 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 to leave that to, to us and, and make that a, a, a part of the development uh, conversation. Yeah, and, and on that note, like I think there's really two different use cases, and um, there is like the very business facing. You know, you want to look at a record and see what's happened at a high level to enable that collaboration that you're talking about. But some clients also are very regulatory in nature and need that full like, here's how every single field ever has changed and who did it and when that happened. A lot of history. Yeah, and so I, I think that um, and that use case is still. Um, kind of separate from what record events is accomplishing, you would want to do maybe like system version tables or something like that to accomplish that. Um, whereas record events is, is more of this business focus. And I'm, I'm kind of curious too, like, because there's the, I want to see this on a record, uh, what has happened to this record, but there's also using mining prep to transform those record events into process mining and be able to do all that analysis. Um, if that's really like a one-to-one -one between those two things, or if there are slight differences in what you would want to see on a record versus what you would consider as important events from the process mining perspective. Yeah, the, the, the short answer is um, a record events is designed to be immediately mineable. So it, when it's going to be out of the box, like you're ready to analyze data. Um, there are certain events you'll want to filter out, not because they're because there are things that aren't part of the process. Like if someone's updating a record, like if I'm updating an order, that's not really part of the business process. That's just an update. So there are there are like minor things you want to do to clean up the data set, but it's designed to be like virtually you virtually get instant, you know, insights with minimal, minimal prep. So But like from what I've noticed, like just using it, um, it seems though that you have to kind of think about your events because at one point I was doing designing and um, I basically, you know, I had an event I was doing like, oh, I'm changing the status throughout the process, right? So let's say you have a process with a bunch of different steps, but you're changing the status from this to this, for, for example. Um, but that won't really give you, like it's not an actual, like the actual event's gonna be change status, right? And that might not be, I don't think that's gonna be very useful from a like a mining perspective. I think you really wanna have like an explicit event saying, oh, we've completed the analysis or the review or something, right? Yeah, absolutely, yep. Yeah, so um, when uh, when defining the, the record events, um, there is a, uh, a, a predefined set of fields that are required basically, uh, but you can also add custom fields. So meaning you could kind of add a flag to it or a status or something where you say, okay, I want to include this type of uh, of uh, events in mining and exclude the other, right? Or could could make a differentiation between uh, this. This is technical events, and this is kind of the more business relevant events, um, and then filter on these. So um, I, I think uh, you could do both, um, but it's important to make to make that clear decision. Do you want business events or technical events or both, and what do you do with it in in uh, afterwards, right? Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, Matt, you really cool. sparked a conversation with <laughs> with your topic there. Uh, that, that was my that was my goal. Yeah. Um, do Do you have any anything else that you wanted to say uh, on this piece specifically, or uh, should we keep the ball rolling and maybe see how record events plays into some of the other topics? I'm sure it's going to come back <laughs> down the line. So let's move All on. Right. All right, let's let's jump over to Mike. So, Mike, you have an interesting experience, right, of going from being a partner, delivering in a consulting sense projects, but then it's kind of like, all right, there you go, I'm I'm out. But now you work for a customer, and it's uh -huh. you're stuck with it. So yeah, um, I mean, I've been I've been sort of all over the place because yeah. um, I I was 
simultaneously in charge of running sort of O and M for a long running project that I've been on since the beginning, as well as simultaneously on some projects where I was like, is uh, trying to stay busy, sort of doing some initial um, architecting setup, but like pre, you know, in the stages before even getting to really build much. Um, and then, you know, so in my, in my current company, I, I'm basically just the, um, the all hands um, team for new development and uh, ongoing O and M. So I'm slotted into a system that was designed and built um, between four and five years ago. Um, so of course that means I'm uh, to a large extent stuck in the sort of sort of the older data architecture for now. Um, yeah. So th I, that's that's what I'm really curious to hear from your perspective of, you know, how do you balance updating things? Um, so that you can make the most of these newer features versus I already have this behemoth. Where do I even start? Um, you know, what what is your approach to records? And also like when you are building from scratch, having the experience dealing with something in the long term, like how does that change the way you think about things up front to know, okay, this is what it's gonna be like in five years? Yeah, I mean it's been tricky so far to manage because like like you said, the the word behemoth really sort of applies. Um to a system with you know 700 plus process models all integrated um, with you know I I lost count at least several dozen CDTs um, that's probably on the low side. Um, Mike, this is a record live views. stream. You can't say CDTs here; it's for records. Sorry, you can bleep that. Sorry, we can. We're not live, right? Just kidding. Um, so, uh, but no, it's but it's hard. So. Um, I've, I've had the chance in the last year to build a um, demo proof of concept from scratch where, um, you know, I follow along with the uh, new announcement webinars and I, you know, voraciously consume the um, release notes whenever they come out. Um, so I was sort of, I was sort of uh, itching to get a chance to use the new stuff. And so when that, when I, when I was asked to build this demo POC, Starting a little bit over a year ago, I was like, "Yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stage some data and use all the new functionality for it." And it was it was interesting because I got to actually take the first dip into you know using the record relationships and stuff. And um, I'm already dedicated to if we, I'll, I'll be one of the ones in charge if we turn that POC into a real application. Um, I'm already, you know it sort of goes without saying at this point that we'll be using the the newer stuff. Um, at the same time, um, I'm sort of, I'm a little bit behind in this, but I've dabbled in creating a sort of a, re a new record type in parallel to one of our big central um, older older data backed record types. Um, so basically sort of as proof of concept, proof of, um, proof of the new functionality and uh, staging it such that maybe eventually I can evolve it to where it will just kind of side side loaded replace the the existing one um or maybe others others here have offered the idea of sort of cherry picking places that we use just use the new one instead of the old one and i'm going to start doing that um as soon as the opportunity presents but at the at the moment it's been limited to basically just setting it up getting the record relationships going um establishing some of the um, same related actions of the many that the existing record has um, and uh, making sure that we're ready to go with all the all the new features um, when it's uh, either when it's mature enough to replace the existing one or when we pass a tipping point where we can't really proceed with the old one anymore um, and it's uh, it's it's going okay um, so far even though like I said I'm a little bit I'm this is, this is sort of on me. I'm a little bit behind on it, um, but it's something I sort of have to slot in doing on, in my free time, let's say. So, all, yeah, all the free time you have, Mike, I'm sure, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> will maintain the behemoth. Yeah. yeah, we were we were talking before the show a little bit about um, about converting applications that are built that are built in older data architectures to um, to data fabric and synced records, and we had had some good discussion around that. Dan, I was curious to hear your perspective. I think because we talked a little bit about how do you how do you convince customers to tactically refactor 
certain pieces of your application to synced records. Do you have any thoughts to share on how you convince some of the benefits on that? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a challenge. Um, you know, you're essentially uh, investing time and effort right now that isn't going to have as many immediate benefits, but you're really investing in that long-term growth of your application. And I think, you know, if you look back at synced records when it first came out, it was a little harder to sell because there were a lot of limitations and there weren't a ton of features that you get out of it. But we've seen with every single release of Appy and there's more and more features that really make the argument a lot more compelling. Uh, yeah. In particular, like this most recent release with the self-service analytics, I think that's going to be the tipping point for a lot of people, especially when that. Yeah. Let's pull the slide up really quick. Just give you something to talk to. We have a slide that's features only available with data sync enabled. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, so all of these things you get with synced records, and you know, with so many different features, uh, I, I really do think it's become a lot more compelling. Also, in addition to these uh, features, there's also the performance benefits that you might get from having your uh, records synced. So it is becoming a little bit easier. Um, I think it's also easy to kind of see and think about what it'll look like a couple of years from now. Um, but ultimately, it's still the age old argument of tech debt and what do you do with tech debt? When do you prioritize tech debt? And uh, at Mastodon, what we do, we actually keep a lot of metrics across all of our projects. Uh, we ask questions of our people running the projects, things like, do you track tech debt? Do you uh, work to address tech debt? And we use all of our project experience to really help convince newer clients that we're working with of the benefits of doing things like this. So, you know, we can see that our most successful projects do track tech debt, do track tech debt and work to address it. Um, we even have some clients that will dedicate like an entire sprint every quarter to doing regression testing and implementing tech debt as a pause from their normal feature development. And that's been really successful. So, so Dan, if you were uh, helping Mike pitch the case to his people that he should get a sprint to work on that <laughs> stuff, like what are a couple of things you might help, help him say? Well, I mean, I think you can, uh, try to quantify some of the benefits, you know, if, um, I've been on a lot of projects where we're in production and I get a lot of requests for, Hey, I need you to pull some data from the database, do this report, uh, crunch some numbers for me. And the business users just can't do that. Maybe that takes, I don't know, uh, a couple hours a week, uh, multiply that by however long you want and say, Hey, look, if we spend just a few hours to start converting some of these, uh, database tables into synced records, you'll get access to self-service analytics. You no longer have to pay me to do it. You can do it on your own. You can do whatever you want. Um, so I think trying to quantify that in terms of dollar amounts is really helpful um, if that's uh, something you can do. I think performance sometimes could be a, like a pretty big selling point um, from my perspective, uh, just because sometimes with uh, CDTs, you'd be doing more queries in the, in an interface. And with this, you can kind of just bundle them up in one, one query because of all the relationships. So I think performance is another, another factor you can use. Is that practically play out in terms of like uh, UI loading times? Yeah, I, I would say so, uh, especially if you have like a lot of relationships, um, yeah. you know, in the past you would do like uh, more queries, much more queries, um, and now you can do them and I've, it even runs them in parallel. So um, yeah. much, much quicker if you have a lot of relationships. Cool. Yeah. Do you guys frequently run into customers complaining about like UI load times, like due to perform like performance issues around CET querying? Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you do because I mean, at some point, you know, the screens become very uh, sometimes can be, become very heavy, right? Uh, there's a lot of data being pulled from different places, and so um, with record types, especially also, you know, the other part that we're we're not talking about, but service back records. Um, but you know, if you're querying, you know, doing a bunch of API calls um, to the outside with sync records, now you get all that data in in one go. Uh, big benefit, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And we have some older sluggish views that give people some load time difficulties sometimes. I think they're used to it, but I know um, for myself using it in our system, it can get a little bit yeah. uh, bogged down. Yeah, but API calls are, are a, a typical, a very typical problem, right? Uh, in two terms, one is performance, uh, uh, typ typically uh, an API, we talk to, kind of internal API things are not optimized for performance. 
um, and availability. So um, when when you have a, an application that that talks to five APIs and every API has a, a availability of 99%, then you end up with, I don't know, 90% or something, right? Uh, when you multiply that and then you're meeting in a, in a difficult uh, situation. Um, what I wanted to say about the about upgrading to to records, um, I think that the great benefit of, of using Appian is that you don't have to. Um, so that that's that's good in one sense, bad in the other, because then you don't have the new features. But at, but at least you you are not urged to kind of or forced to do something and spend uh, spend money for for nothing right because if you don't need the new features or don't want them but still would have to do the upgrade then you kind of need to pay for nothing right um and uh so that's good um i had uh in our team we have an, an internal or an application that we we built internally uh and we decided to do a full upgrade uh, uh on records and it's not a, a huge application, but still, still a bit, right? Um, it has a, a data model with about I don't know twelve entities or something, and then going from full CDT query entity um, everything to all in on uh, on records, data fabric, synced records, uh, query record type all over the place means uh, that we actually had to touch really each and every. Now, almost every object in the application. So interfaces, query expressions, process models. Um, and and that's and that was a significant effort that we decided to spend on. Um, we, we actually underestimated that a bit. So um, what I want to say here is that a a a kind of in-place upgrade of a of a full application specifically if it's such a behemoth uh, 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 mic like yours is probably not a good idea uh, of course if if you uh, can convince your business to spend the money then <laughs> go for it that's perfect but um, but uh, kind of uh, an, a, a, a smaller step upgrade uh, would probably be a, a good idea but it sh I think it's something that it's not to underestimate and should be carefully planned uh, to, you know, to avoid uh, uh, mistakes and problems uh, later on. Yeah. So, Dan, you're the one that's that's, uh, you know, you're the gung ho about refactoring. So uh, what's what's your approach when it is a big, a big undertaking? Like, OK, we do get one sprint a quarter to work on this. How do we prioritize what's the best use of the sprint? Yeah, I, I honestly agree to some extent with uh, Stefan. Um, I like the suggestion that Mike talked about earlier, where you know you don't have to do it all at once, right? You can break it down into smaller pieces, and I think that's the approach that I would take. Um, if it's a really large application, you're not going to convert it entirely to synced records in one sprint. So I would definitely take the approach that Mike was describing, where you kind of leave what you already have in place and don't touch that for now. Don't worry about doing, you know, endless regression testing on your entire application, but in parallel to your old CDT and record types, create a new synced record that, uh, you know, uses the same underlying database tables and start dropping in the um, nodes into your processes to keep that record synced and up to date. And then, at the start, it's not going to give you a lot. You know, maybe you do get the ability to do things like self-service analytics just from that uh, standalone record type that you have in parallel. But that'll be a stepping stone that you can expand on. You know, over the course of the next couple quarters or years or whatever, as um, you have more time to you know convert more things over, and as Appian continues to release all these cool features that make it more and more compelling to. Uh, the people who are, you know, paying for this at the end of the day to actually commit the time to doing the fuller conversion. What about from a training perspective? I f that that could be kind of hard, especially with newer developers at where we're trying so hard to teach them about the new ways to do things, but they still need to be able to work with CDTs if they've only been doing Appian for a year and, you know, have not had much experience for that. So, um, like, how do you manage the refactoring also from a variety of, experience level perspective 
Yeah, that's a good question. It's <laughs> we're we're actually like looking back at all of our uh, you know new hire training programs right now to decide exactly how much CBTs we want to teach versus how much of the new sync records we want to teach. And I think you kind of need to teach both um, because especially, you know, at Mastodon, we work with so many different clients. Some are brand new to Appian, some have been using Appian for 10 years. So you never know uh, what types of records a person's going to be uh, engaging with on their project. So I really do think you have to teach both and give people the foundation to understand both types of records so that regardless of uh, what project you get put on, you have the tools to deal with either type. Yeah, we have to keep it balanced for now. Yeah. <laughs> but for no, net new, for net new projects, do you ever say, "Hey, let's build a CDT for this," yeah. or is that is is it. that only if the if the sync <laughs> limits are like way you know not high enough, or you know, is is there a case now for new projects to start with CDTs? I, I would strongly recommend against it. I mean, maybe there are cases where, where you would want to, um, but you know, I, I think for a totally new application, it would just be start everything as synced records and go from there. And you might run into some hiccups that you wouldn't have run into if you had gone the CBT route, but it's going to be worth it in the long run, almost certainly. So yeah, I, I can speak to that a little bit, which is, um, I built the, the, Demo POC I built last year mm -hmm. uh, got relatively reasonably full feature. And uh, I went into it with the mindset of, well, I'll just use records. And then if I have to build a CDT for this, eventually I'll just do it to, you know, brute force things. And I think I got all the way through the POC we demoed to like the vice president levels. And I never ended up having to make a CDT, um, even though I was perfectly willing to as a fallback. I think I got, got away with using all uh, record type data for it. So that was, uh, I wasn't even expecting that to happen, but I think that ended up being a, a win for that. That's awesome. That's great. That's great to hear. Like, like Dan, you said earlier, like, I think it, I think records have come a long way. I know when I first joined Appian, you still had to use CDTs to write, like you still had to write to data store. You couldn't write the records. And man, I remember when they released write records, I was just like, thank God. I was so done. Like I remember going through boot camp as a new Appian employee and being confused about why there were two data structures. And I mean, it's it's evolved tremendously. So I'm really grateful for all the all the work the data fabric folks have done. Bad time um, to join. <laughs> yeah, I know. I joined join just before things got good. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But so I think and interesting. I talked to a partner a while ago who said like one of the things they do is they, they they're also thinking about the training from the training standpoint. They have. It's interesting because when you have a lot of different teams, like in a partner firm or at a customer, even within the teams, there's cultures around what technology they want to use. The team leads can have a lot of influence. Everyone's nodding on what actually gets used. And so it, it, there's organizational cultural challenges too. And I appreciate all the work that you guys have been doing. I know a lot of our partners are doing to try and really frankly provide more value to customers and like get people on board. I just, I know it takes a lot of legwork and relationship building and convincing and demoing new features that we're putting out. So I'm grateful you guys read the release notes because like reading the release notes and like going through the webinars is like a critical part of how we try to communicate the new, like good stuff that you guys hopefully get for free, you know, with the data, with data fabric. So I appreciate you guys reading that stuff and reconveying it to your teams. Cause that's a critical piece of, of how we get more people on board. Uh -oh. <laughs> you guys are doing hard. You guys are doing amazing work. Yeah, you guys are doing hard yeah. work. They, yeah, they thanks are. a lot. Um, uh, there, there's one one thing I would uh, I, I wanted to add to making the decision between uh, the 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 old <laughs> CDTs directors and the records um, is that at least as of now um, in in the current current release there are a few limitations with specifically with synced records. Um, so uh, if I um, when I make the decision about going one or the other way, I would say it's not going one or the other way. It's typically going mostly records with some exceptions. That is kind of my go-to way. Um, and, uh, and the limitations are very clearly described in the documentation. So when you make that architectural decision on what you are, what you want to do, 
um, then please make sure to 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 visit that and and make a make a good decision. As an example, if you I don't know you need to import uh, a trillion uh, uh, lines of of data uh, in your database, then uh, that will not work with sync records, um, at least as, not as of now. Um, and uh, there are a few other a few other things that that you really should kind of keep in mind when when making that decision. Yeah, to your point, if you if you if you need to have all of that data in the application and you don't want to use source filters, yeah, you've got you got a problem for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, to be honest, that that became a bit more complicated with kind of the, the 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 many choices that we now have, which is good, right? So you could you could do CDT, you could do a normal record, you could async record, and each and every option that that I have, which is now three, if I count it correctly, um, has pros and cons, right? There are a few use cases which only work with one or the other um, or work tremendously better with one or the other. Um, and then making that uh, that decision um, it can be a, a bit of a challenge at times. But uh, records all in as, as much as possible. That's my my conclusion here. <laughs> Yeah. And one thing I would add to that too is, you know, the, the documentation clearly says what some of the limitations are. Uh, one of my favorite things has always been to try to break Appian or at least, you know, push what it is capable of doing. And I think after playing around with it, like there are some ways that you can sort of stretch those limitations. So I would recommend anybody that is considering it and, and considering whether it's worth it or even possible to make the switch over, do more than just read the docs, try to play around with it. Cause, uh, you know, you might learn some tips and tricks along the way for sure. I'm not, I'm not endorsing what you're saying, Dan, for the record, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, some yeah. private R and D is is uh, also uh, super important uh, and and part of almost my daily job. Yeah. Josh, what uh, what questions do you have for them from your own, you know, personal? Uh, <laughs> PM goals uh, that could maybe be helped by talking to a, a skilled pr practitioner mm. who's actually using these things that you're talking about, uh, you know, all day. Yeah. So like one thing that I think about, so uh, there was a slide earlier with all the features that you get for free with synced records. We don't have to pull it up if we can. Great. And like one of the things I think about is um, we're trying to give you guys as much for free with the data fabric. And one thing I note about a lot of these features, some of them are, are developer facing features, right? Custom record fields, um, uh, no code security configurations. You guys have to, have to actually configure something. Still valuable for end users, but you have to do some work. Some of these users get very much like for free. Auto generate user filters, yes, you guys have to configure them, but I think you like click a button and we like automatically create some filters for you, if I recall correctly. And like self service analytics um, is basically like you get for free if you're using Data Fabric. Um, and so I, I think a lot about how do we, because you guys are really, ultimately, all of us are pulling towards more value for end users. And the less work you have to do to deliver that value, the better. Um, and you guys also have to do the work of actually getting your customers excited about that value, putting it in front of them, when it, like maybe demoing stuff for them. So one thing I'm, I think about that a lot in terms of how do we get work through you guys and make it easier for you guys to convey what people get for free using data fabric i'm wondering i i, I talked i touched on this earlier but like how do you convey that data how do you convey that value to your to your customers like do you actually go do like demos for them and show them some of these features like when self-service analytics is is released and you guys are all upgraded and like ready to show that to customers are you going to go like hey guys this is released like let me do a demo for you like this is the latest feature this quarter or how do, how do you like actually get that new stuff in front of customers so I have a, a quick story about that. It's not actually about records and synced records, but about APIs. Um, a while ago, when you introduced that feature or made it kind of more approachable, um, I had a pitch at a client uh, uh, pitching Appian as a platform. Um, and uh, people came up and said, oh, we have so tr uh, 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 trouble with integrations and it always takes ages and so on and so on. Uh, and, I, and then I said, OK, how much time do you give me to implement an API in Appian? Uh, and I thought, and I said, mm, I don't know. And then I said, okay, I'm giving myself 30 seconds, right? <laughs> uh, 
Um, <laughs> and of course, it took me only, I don't know, 10 or something. Um, and I did that in a pitch at the client. So um, sometimes this is something where you kind of, you, you pull, you can pull something out of, of your head, like a, like a white rabbit and say, hey, this is something that, that you get for free in no time. Uh, and we can just kind of turn the switch and, and it's there, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, and something like 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 this uh, help of course help, helps a lot in 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 kind of selling sp either specific features or making clients aware of that this exists and then of course it's always the kind of transformation into and and now what what is the business value of that right because an API by itself is is not a business value. Um, I I'm also curious like. Right, an API is not a business value. Like a lot of times, like in my mind, the end users, business users, like why should they care how you implement it as long as it works for them? Right, like how much are they, do they really care about what you're doing? Like don't don't you have a lot of autonomy to just say I'm going to build this how I think it's the right way to build it? Or you know what is that balance like? Yeah, yeah. From my end, like I don't think my the people or I don't want to speak for them, but I mean I don't think they um, they they want to know exactly that you know I'm using record types in the back end. Um, but uh, that being said, uh, like you said, Josh, I think the big selling features is when you know let's say I'll just like I, I do um, you know every time there's a, a new release, I'll, I'll go just go through my clients, you know, oh, here's here are the new features. And the best features are the ones where, for example, self-service analytics was a great one because it was like, well, you didn't do anything and it's there, right? Mm -hmm. And I, th I, you know, hoping process HQ is gonna be sort of this, like the same way, right? You're gonna just, it's gonna be there, right? So th those are the type of features that, you know, you're like, oh, you know, you don't have to do anything. They just released a, a new version and now you get it for free. Right. That's the, mm -hmm. that's a, for me, like the best, the best features because you're, it, it proves that the, the platform evolves, you know, you're coding your apps, but the, 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 the plat or the platform evolves also at the same time. And you get like, you know, features almost like <laughs> double, you get business features and you also get like platform features. Right? So you actually go to your customers sometimes, like, like, maybe not well, every quarter, but how often? I, I would say my current customer, I would say like all, all right. I won't say all my, the, my past customers, but my, the current customers, for example, will be, you know, I'll just do a presentation, uh, just say, hey, 23.4 came out, uh, here are the new features. Um, I'm realizing, I just realized that we're almost at an hour. So uh, maybe <laughs> we should just, uh, go, we'll do a last quick round robin of, of final thoughts or one takeaway if someone only tuned in right now, what do you want them to take away? Maybe we'll start backwards from what we did for intros. And Mike, you want to start? Oh, I'm on the spot now. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, I guess my my main uh, my main takeaway is just it's great to just keep on top of all the new functionality. Um, and um, I'm always I'm in the unique position, luckily, where I can just start implementing new features as they come out and push them to production without. Uh, too much oversight since I sort of am the customer, um, and my my immediate supervisor is our product owner, um, and then my VP is the actual high up product owner, and we just um, we it's it's up to us, and he usually just tell me tells me it's up to you. So um, I put in new features and test them out and uh, put stuff in right away, and it's great. Great. So if you're like Mike and you're in charge, then just. Do the new things, just do it. Yeah. Uh, Matt, final final thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, very excited for what uh, the, the future brings. Uh, looking forward to Process HQ and how that's gonna tie in with record events, seeing how that works. So um, I'm excited for uh, what comes next. Cool, Stefan? What should I say? Uh, <laughs> adding to, to Mike, Mike and Matt, uh, uh, all in on records. That's the future. Uh, CDTs are on the way out. Um, a few things missing will improve over time uh, with the next releases. Uh, looking forward to that. And uh, I always try to try to be as progressive as my clients uh, allow me to be. Right. Yeah. Great. All right, Dan. Tied up. 
All right. Yeah. For me as a developer, I would just really recommend staying on top of all the latest features. Even if you're not implementing them right now, it's just really important to be aware of what all the possibilities are so that, you know, even if you are on an older uh, application with some of the older features, you can really start building that case for making the transition over to the new record types and taking advantage of Appy into its fullest. So great. A lot of, uh, Great insights from all of you. Thank you all for joining. Josh, I hope this was also interested, interesting to you from a PM perspective. Um, next week, we're going to have another live stream similar to this. A lot of people on uh, to talk about uh, AI. It's our holiday AI party. But uh, for now, we're signing off here. Thank you all. And uh, see you in the next live stream. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.